It's been almost two decades since we started our journey to educate and help you take action so you may better manage your financial future. Our goal is to help you accomplish your life's purpose. This podcast reveals financial tips, strategies, and insights that will help you to set your financial goals and guide you along the way. This is Managing Your Financial Future, brought to you by the advisors at Lucia Capital Group. It is all about, at least for us, managing your financial future, talking about strategies, talking about financial issues, and maybe potential solutions to whatever challenges come up in your financial life. Johnny Dean here. That's me, moderator of the podcast. I want to remind folks I'm not an advisor, but uh, I, uh, I, I, I really feel like I have learned so much hanging out with Professor Plum. I seem to say that quite a bit, but I really do, uh, I really, I really really do feel more knowledgeable. And so I would urge anybody who is uh, at all interested in their own personal finance, anybody who uh, wants to uh, explore their own personal financial situation with a little bit more knowledge, because knowledge is helpful, I would urge you to continue to listen to this podcast uh, as as often as you can, because I believe you're really going to learn something. And I think we're a lot of fun, too. Professor Plum, welcome. Yes, sir. Yes. Nice to have you back. Certified financial planner, professional, Long time uh, advisor and uh, all that stuff. 30 years now, I like to mention your credentials because I think it's important. It's important to know that experience counts. I've been dealing at, <laughs> I, I've been dealing in my house. So we, we, we've got flooring people in and I've got painters and I've got all this stuff. And I'll tell you what, Professor, the people with the, the when they tell me, hey, I've got 30 years experience doing this. I know what I'm doing. It shows. So when you tell me you've got 30 years of experience doing prof- uh, uh, financial planning, uh, it, personally, I would say I I think that's a very positive thing. And the only thing I would say to that is it's 30 plus. <laughs> well, 30 plus. I don't want to age you too much here, you know? Oh, I'm old. I can admit it. I'm getting there. <laughs> You're getting there. You turned a major corner this past year, Professor Plum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> I'm not quite there yet, but give it a couple more years. Anyway, you know where you, you, you're approaching? I can tell people that, you know, you, you, you hit your, your, the beginning of your seventh decade, which means you're 60. Okay, I just want to put you in that, in that crowd. But do you believe, would you believe, Professor Plum, that you will be eligible for uh, the uh, retirement benefits. I never thought I'd say this, but you are less than 24 months. I won't give your birth date, but you are less than 24 months away from being eligible, potentially, for some retirement benefits, at least as what as allowed by the Social Security Administration rules. Um, uh-huh. If I were to uh, quit working in the next uh, less than 24 months, yep. Uh, I could start receiving a reduced Social Security benefit. I could do that. I don't plan on it. I don't plan on quitting either, but no. um, But I'm I'm, I'm getting closer. It's just the thought. It's just the thought. It's it's like having the senior discount available. I don't plan on going to the movie theater anytime soon, but if I want to, I could probably get the senior discount. But it was interesting. I mean, you talk about different time horizons. I remember when I turned 55 and thought, well, you know what? If anything happens, I can start accessing my 401k now. I hit 59 and a half. Well, you know what? I can get into my my IRA if I need to without penalty. 62 is the next step down the line where there's something available to me that wasn't available to me before. That's right. Yeah. Now, it, 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 we, we could do a whole other show on that, uh, accessing it at age 55. You have to quit work or be fired or whatever. But you have terminate to terminate employment. Terminate employment, and you're you're eligible uh, to to take that company's plan and uh, withdraw tax. You got to pay taxes on it, but you know you oh, yeah, pay tax. Right. So, <laughs> but but when we talk about taxes, this this is this is a nice lead in anyway. Uh, social. Security, Social Security benefits. Ever since, was I guess it was about 1980, was it 83? It was 83 when they first introduced taxation of Social Security benefits. So we've had Social Security benefits since since the late uh, 30s or 1940 or whatever it happens to be. I can't recall because I was very young at that time. However, <laughs> <laughs> which puts me at about age, you know, 90. No, I'm kidding. Uh, uh, w- taxation on those benefits never happened until... The early 80s, 1983, uh, that was prior to, of course, to the 1986 Tax Reform Act, which changed a lot of things. But, Professor, uh, one of the things they started taxing was benefits. And right. uh, we have well give a brief. There, there, there were two levels of taxation, and they happened about 10 years apart. Let's just talk about that very quickly for people that don't know. Right. In 1983, they went through and they said one of the ways to save Social Security, the trust fund and everything that's supposedly out there, is that we want to start taxing Social Security. The rationale at that time was that 
50% of the money that went into Social Security was paid for by the employee on an after-tax basis, and 50% of the money that went into the, you know, the benefit, or calculate, went into the trust fund, supposedly, was from an employer on a pre-tax basis. So half the money paid on your behalf into the Social Security Trust Fund was pre-tax and half was uh, post-tax. So we should be able to tax up to half of the benefit that you're receiving because half it was it was put in by after-tax money or pre-tax money. That was the rationale in 1983. That worked fine. They set it up so that if the only income you had was Social Security, that you would not pay any taxes. And at the time, they set it up that unless you're modified adjusted gross income, something or your provisional income, there's a couple of names for it out there, was over certain thresholds. At the time for a single person, it was 25,000. And for a married couple, it was 32,000. Not a bad, and, but not a bad salary, by the way, for 1983. I mean, it's it's not a ton, yeah, but it's... And it wasn't salary. That was your total income from all sources of income, but only included half of the social security that you were receiving for that provisional income. So and for so some people, you know, thirty thousand dollars, thirty five thousand dollars of income, um, they weren't paying any tax on their Social Security. They weren't paying any tax on anything. But then move ahead. So that was happening. And that started happening back in 1983, 84 time horizon. And then in 1993, they said, you know, well, half the money went in pre-tax, half the money went in post-tax, but it's been earning interest all this time, too. So we really should be able to tax more than just 50 percent of the benefit. So we're going to set some other thresholds, and they set them a little bit higher than the original thresholds. And if you go over that threshold, then we will tax up to 85% of your overall Social Security benefit that you receive. Now, they set these thresholds back in 83. They put some new ones in in 93, and they haven't changed the thresholds since. There's been no cost of living, no anything. So where, you know, somebody who retired in 1983 with, you know, income of, $35,000 may not have been paying tax on anything. It's hard to live. And that was a pretty good retirement back in 1983. Sure. That's not as good of a retirement today as it was then. And so more and more people are tripping into the taxability of the Social Security benefit. Now, there's a couple of misnomers out there, a couple of misinformation pieces. It doesn't matter what age you are. The age has nothing to do with the taxability of a Social Security benefit. The type of benefit you're receiving, widow's benefit, widower's benefit, retirement benefit, spousal benefit, disability benefit, has nothing to do with the taxability of the benefit. So it's not like you get to 70 and it won't be taxable or it's taxable, you know, whatever. Age and the style of benefit has nothing to do with it. Big, it all has yeah. to do with what other income do you have? If Big you have no other income your social security will not be taxable in today's world. Now, if you have other income, IRA distributions, interest, dividends, capital gains, uh, pension, uh, anything, it goes into, it's all, th the only thing that's not thrown into the hopper for this are di qualified distributions from a Roth IRA. They don't show up in it. But even tax-free municipal bond interest, which isn't taxable, is put into the formula to determine if any of your Social Security is taxable, and if so, how much? And as we said before, up to 85% of the benefit that you receive could be taxable. Under current law, that's the maximum, not the tax rate. That is not a tax rate. That is how much of the benefit. So if I'm receiving $10,000 in benefits, at the most, $8,500 of those would be taxable. And so how much do I pay in taxes on that? Well, it depends on how much other income I have. Uh, so it's... It's a formula. It's a crazy formula. Uh, don't really want to get into it no. right here. But if your income, which is all sources of income plus half the Social Security, exceeds 25000 for a single person, 32000 for a, a married person, then some of your Social Security is going to be taxable. So for those who thought their benefits would never be taxable, and in some cases they could go along, I guess, for what, a few years maybe, or would and, and not have taxable uh, benefits, and all of a sudden they, they do become taxable? I mean, have, have you seen that? We have seen that where somebody retires at, you know, 62, 63, they've got a small pension, they get their Social Security, and those two pieces combined uh, don't reach the limit of taxability of Social Security. They don't reach the limit of taxes, at, you know, and they're living comfortably. And then they hit 70. Well, in the old days, they hit 70 and a half, now age 72, and they get a required minimum distribution, and they have to start taking their RMD out, and that RMD 
throws their more of their Social Security into taxation and also is taxable itself. And so it can really jump a tax bracket if that's not paid, you know, if you're not paying much attention to it. Well, you know, one uh, of the things you've talked about often is is tax management. Uh, is there a way potentially to manage the taxes on Social Security or is it more a case of, well, uh, here's how much you made. There's really nothing you can do about it. Well, it depends. I mean, there's sometimes where there's nothing you can do about it because you've waited too long and now you're 70 and 72. Uh, your pension is set. Your Social Security is set. You, you know, that's all. And you let your IRA grow. You've used your personal money for the first you know, six, seven years of retirement. And now you've got required minimum distributions and there's very little you can do about it other than accelerating even more taxation to try to reduce the IRA for the future. But if you are in the early years of, of retirement or you're getting close to retirement, if you plan it out, there are ways to potentially utilize, you know, to deferral techniques on Social Security uh, or using lower tax brackets in the early years to try to reduce the required minimum distribution in the future. That goes against almost everything I read in uh, you know, when to take money out of different types of accounts. They always say, leave your IRA until the required minimum distribution date. I do not agree with that. Not if we have the ability to take it out and pay less taxes today than we're going to pay in the future. So it has to do with, yeah, right, tax managing your portfolio. And I won't say that it will always work, but there's usually something that can be done. Now, we're talking about the taxability of Social Security benefits themselves. There's also something on the other side where if you're making more money, where you you know your tax your, your Social Security is going to be taxed at 85 percent. There's no way around it. Your pension's fifty thousand dollars a year, and then you throw the Social Security on top of that. Yeah, you're going to pay tax on 85 percent of it. Uh, but then on the other side, you have to worry about the Medicare premiums going up if you make too much money. Something called the Income Related Monthly Adjustment Amount or IRMA. Uh, and so you want to be able to look at both sides of the equation. How do I work this? Where is that sweet spot? that I can pay some taxes and not too much today and try to keep myself out of the higher taxes in the future. It's um, something that I th- I think a lot of people don't think about um, when they're making well, no, certain Well, no, they don't even hear move. the fact that, I mean, maybe their parents never paid any tax on their Social Security. Maybe, you know, their friends have retired and they don't pay any tax on their Social Security. And so they, they just have never thought of it before. And all of a sudden, boom, they're going to, they say, well, I'm going to get, you know, thirty, forty thousand dollars between my spouse and I and Social Security, and another twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars, whatever it is, from pensions, and I've got this IRA distribution. So I'm only going to pay tax on the pension, the IRA distribution. That won't be so bad. Uh, and then, boom, a big chunk of their Social Security is taxable as well, and their taxes go up a lot. And it really can affect a surviving spouse, where everything was going along okay, and maybe you know they were in a position where they didn't have a whole lot of taxability on their Social Security. But then one of them passes away, the lower Social Security goes away, and their tax brackets, the brackets, the amount of money you can keep in a bracket without going to the next bracket is about in half of what it used to be. So now that surviving spouse has more taxation, more taxation on their Social Security and less income to deal with. Their expenses go up and their income goes down. That is not a great situation. So you have to plan for that as well. And it can be difficult if you don't know that taxes are potentially going to happen, I would assume. Do you see... If you don't know it's there, it's hard to plan against it. Well, absolutely. Now, do you see these problems cropping up for people more often when it comes time to, as you were were talking about required minimum distributions, when it comes time to take required minimum distributions, especially if they... Uh, had not uh, if they don't need the money and they've kind of ignored the fact that RMDs are around the corner? We see it cropping up mostly with people who have not done any planning and talked to anybody that uh, knows about these you know pitfalls that are coming up. And then they come in and they say, I've started my RMDs and my taxes got jacked. They, they skyrocketed. Why? What can I do about this? What did I what did my tax repair or what did I do wrong? And it was like, well, you, you had to take the money out. I mean, there's nothing you can do about it. So now let's talk about ways to manage that and in some cases managing it means taking more out up to certain limits to try to reduce the future required distributions to try to reduce the future uh distributions for a surviving spouse maybe this is where roth conversions come into play now obviously you cannot convert an rmd thankfully we do not have a required minimum distribution for any account in 2020 but 2021 we're going to have them back Mm -hmm. and so we have to look at 
over and above the RMD, maybe one that, you know, you're already complaining about taxes, so I'm going to tell you to pay more. Rick, are you crazy? Yeah, maybe maybe I'm crazy, but in some cases it makes more sense because you know a little pain today for a lot of gain tomorrow that can sometimes work, and sometimes you're just in that hole where no matter it's a catch twenty two. No matter what you do, it's going to hurt. Well, and and, and maybe you can have some consolation and say, well, I've got a very large required minimum distribution, but that also means it's because I got a very large IRA or four hundred one k or whatever. It right, I mean to be. taxes. So. In, in taxes are a good problem. <laughs> they can when be, the, not every time. For the time. type of person that we're talking about now where they've got a required minimum distribution that they don't need and they have to pay taxes on it and they're complaining about the taxes, we all want to be in that situation. We all want to have too much income and the fact that we have to pay taxes on income we don't need, you know, that's a good problem. So... The, the, the bad problems are where you don't have the income. So what? You don't have any income taxes, but you don't have any income either. So if if, if I've got if I know this, if I've got a, a large IRA, let's say, or a bunch of money in IRAs, and I know I'm going to have a fairly high, or in some cases a very high, required minimum distribution come age 72, um, and it's you know it, it, it's coming up. Um, how soon in advance should I start thinking about this stuff? I mean, I would think, and I could be wrong, but I would think that if I'm just a couple of years away from, you know, age 72 and RMDs are staring me in the face, that there's less I can do. How early should you be looking at this stuff? Well, I mean, for a lot of people, it's hard to deal with while they're still working because even though their income and retirement may be very nice, their income while they're working is still even higher. But for a lot of people, it's when they first, the first full year of retirement, when their income has gone down, they don't have their earned income anymore. Uh, and they, they're maybe not at the RMDH, so they don't have that happening yet. So they might have some, a couple of years where they could do some conversions and start to reduce that IRA. Or like I said before, where you can defer taking Social Security till a later date. Maybe live off of a higher IRA distribution where you're not paying any taxes on your Social Security because you're not receiving it. So that by the time you do start receiving your Social Security, you don't have as much in the IRA. It's either over in the Roth or it's your personal money or whatever the case may be. So it, there are it, 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 the planning starts today. Whether and it may be that you decide not to do any conversions today and you wait until you retire. But sometimes now may be a good time to do some Roth conversions. 2020 may be a great time to do Roth conversions because for some people their income is a lot lower than in normal years. And we know there's no required minimum distribution this year, so that opens up uh, even people that are in their RMD age bracket the ability to maybe do some conversions a little more than they would normally be able to be able to do. But 2020, you know, this is one of those. How do we make some lemonade out of this weird year? Uh, <laughs> if your income is down this year. Maybe this year is a good year to do a Roth conversion. Could be some some potential planning opportunities out there. Um, we haven't heard yet, at least not as of this recording, about the potential of uh, also having no required minimum distributions for 2021. Uh, I guess that could change, but as of right now, the normal required minimum distribution rules will apply for 2000 uh, for uh, 2021. Correct. Currently, that's the way we're. That's what. Yeah, the the wave of RMDs was only for tax year 2020. They would have to actually get together and do something to waive them again in 2021. And good luck with that. <laughs> I don't think anything's going to happen on that front. Uh, interesting stuff. So there, there are some potential solutions, Professor, to the Social Security taxation problem. One last thing I think we should, we should clear up because I know people have asked this, and I found a question online where somebody had said, wait a minute, you threw about around this number, 50%, 85%. You mean to tell me that I've got an 85% tax rate on my Social Security? That's going to kill my entire payment. Um, well, actually, I mentioned earlier, that is not the tax rate. Yes. The tax rate is whatever your normal that. tax rate is, you know, 12, 22, 24%, uh, maybe 10%. That the 50% and 85% number is how much of your benefit could be subject to taxes. Now, it's also not a trigger. It's not that I go over the, the threshold. I said the, the single threshold was 25000 So if I go to 26000 it doesn't mean, boom, 50% of my benefit is taxable. Now, the formula, is it, it phases in that 50% number. So 50% of the amount over the threshold 
yeah. is taxable. When I get to the 85% threshold for uh, a married, for a single person, it'd be what, $34,000. Okay. If I go to 34,010, I don't, boom, 85% of my benefit doesn't become taxable over a 10,000 or a $10 difference in my Magi. Okay, it's, so it's just it's the amount the over. That phases yeah. it in. Yeah. And it is very dependent upon where the money is coming from. Uh, it's all about what other income you have and how, how much you're taxing. I mean, you can have somebody that makes $50,000 that have a very 50,000 combined of total income and have very, very different taxations. One of them has, you know, 30,000 from social security and 20,000 from, uh, a pension. That's one set. One has 40,000 from social security and 10,000. That's a completely different tax situation. Uh, one has 10,000 of social security and the other and 40,000 of pension and IRA. That person's going to pay a lot more in taxes than the, the other two people. It has to, even though their total income was the same, where it's coming from matters. Is it mostly coming from social security or is it mostly coming from other sources that, and that all works into this crazy formula they've come up with. Which I think allows for some decent planning opportunities, at least. Uh, it can. It, it, for... And, you know, my goal is to have as much Social Security as I can get and as much other income as I can get. And I will complain bitterly all the way to the bank about the taxes that I'm paying. <laughs> it's kind of like the uh, goal of uh, I'd love to be in the, the estate tax realm, you know. Oh, I, I, got... I would love to be in a half. My family would have to worry. I'd actually have to worry about uh, if somebody were to, you know, leave me a hundred million dollars and I had to pay some estate tax or the estate had to pay some estate taxes before I got it. I'll cry me a river right now. Exactly. Uh, I would love to be able to, my family to be in the situation where they would have to worry about estate taxes. Currently that would mean that I'm worth $22 million or more. Uh -huh. uh, I'm not there yet. I'd, I'd like to be, but I'm not. No, I'm working on it, though. We're all working, working on, on it. it. Uh, if you'd like to work on your finances, I'm not promising that you're going to be worth $22 million. Absolutely not. But if you would like at least to talk to somebody about your social, uh, not just your Social Security, but the taxation of your Social Security benefits, there are a lot of other uh, decisions that need to be made with Social Security, and oftentimes it can revolve around things like taxation and required minimum distributions. If that's you, you can talk to Professor Rick Plummer, any of the Lucia Capital Group advisors, 800-644-1150, the off-air number at Lucia Capital Group, 800-644-1150. You can also get some more information. You can uh, email. You may already know this because you're listening to the podcast, but you can go to our website, luciacap.com, L-U-C-I-A-C-A-P, luciacap.com, and get in touch with the pre uh, uh, professor i'll find some also find some uh, articles and things like that there if you need some more information we're we're all about education and we believe that an educated investor is potentially a much better investor again 800-644-1150 our number my thanks to professor rick plum as always we'll have more to talk about next week uh, i'm johnny dean for professor rick plum this has been managing your financial future i thank you again for listening and we will talk to you again on the next podcast the information provided should not be considered specific tax, legal, or investment advice and is not specific to any individual's personal circumstances. To the extent that this material concerns tax matters, it is not intended or written to be used and cannot be used by a taxpayer for the purpose of avoiding penalties that may be imposed by law. Each taxpayer should seek independent advice from a tax professional based on his or her individual circumstances. This material was gathered from sources believed to be reliable. However, its accuracy cannot be guaranteed. Different types of investments and or investment strategies involve varying levels of risk and there can be no assurance that any specific investment or investment strategy, including the investments purchased and or investment strategies devised by LCG will either be suitable or profitable for a client's or prospective client's portfolio. Thus, investments may result in a loss of principal. Accordingly, no client or prospective client should assume that the presentation or any component thereof serves as the receipt of or a substitute for personalized advice from LCG or from any other investment professional. You should always seek counsel of the appropriate advisor prior to making any investment decision. All investments are subject to risk, including the loss of principal. This material was gathered from sources believed to be reliable. However, its accuracy cannot be guaranteed. These materials are provided for general information and educational purposes based upon publicly available information from sources is believed to be reliable. We cannot assure the accuracy or completeness of these materials. The information in these materials may change at any time and without notice. The information contained herein does not constitute an offer to sell or a solicitation of an offer to buy securities. Investment products described herein may not be offered for sale in any state or jurisdiction in which such an offer, solicitation, or sale would be unlawful or prohibited by the specific offering documentation. The information provided is based on current laws which are subject to change at any time. Lucia Capital Group is not affiliated with or endorsed by the Social Security Administration or any government agency. Social Security rules can be complex. For more information about Social Social Security benefits.
benefits, visit the SSA website at ssa.gov or call 800-772-1213 to speak with an SSA representative. Traditional IRA account owners have considerations to make before performing a Roth IRA conversion. These primarily include income tax consequences on the converted amount in the year of conversion, withdrawal limitations from a Roth IRA, and income limitations for future contributions to a Roth IRA. In addition, if you are required to take a required minimum distribution or RMD in the year you convert, you must do so before converting to a Roth IRA. IRA withdrawals will be taxed at ordinary income rates. Withdrawals prior to age 59 and a half may also be subject to a 10% penalty tax. Roth IRA earnings will be taxed at ordinary income rates and a 10% penalty tax will apply if withdrawn prior to age 59 and a half or within five years of the date the Roth IRA was established, whichever is longer. Municipal bond interest may be subject to the alternative minimum tax. Rick Plum is a registered representative with and securities and advisory services offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor and member FINRA SIPC. The investment professionals are affiliated with LPL Financial and are conducting business using the name Lucia Capital Group, a separate entity from LPL Financial.